We've brought together four people here who are all likely to take the vaccine, but who have some concerns. And to answer their questions, a man who is known for giving a straight answer to a straight question, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Professor Jonathan Van Tam. Uh, Jonathan Hill, if you would like to go first, I understand you've been shielding. What question would you like to ask the professor? For people like myself who are currently shielding due to having underlying health conditions, will the vaccine be suitable for us to have? And if so, will it then eradicate the need for shielding long term? Jonathan, thanks for the question. So um, you're quite right. Um, if you've been asked to shield, you should have been shielding um, for quite some time. And I do understand how difficult that is um, to sustain week on week, month on month. And absolutely, um, I expect that this vac well, the vaccines that we have available as they become available um, will be absolutely appropriate um, for people who are shielding. Now, I would add a little bit to that, if I may, and say that one of the things we know about many people who are shielding is that they have immune systems that are not working as well as um, a fully healthy person's immune system. That's the reason why they have to be so cautious and so careful um, about um, taking precautions not to catch coronavirus. Um, we absolutely know that these vaccines that we get are going to be effective. I can't say individually how effective they're going to be in people who have immune systems that are damaged or not working as well um, in, in each case. So from, from, from your perspective, yes, it's absolutely important that you get it. Yes, I am very confident that um, people in the shielding category will absolutely be offered vaccines at an appropriate time, according to priority as laid out by our expert group, the JCVI. But do I think this is going to be a kind of instant fix for you and mean that we can have immediate confidence that you can just, um, you know, throw off the shackles and um, go out into the, in, into the world you, you, you previously enjoyed? Um, not immediately, but hopefully over time and with caution as the data builds up. But I can't be sure that you're going to respond to the vaccine as well as somebody with a fully working immune system, if you have a, um, you know, um, if you're shielding because of an immune uh, yes. problem, yes, um, yeah. then I can't absolutely assure you of that. And I think it would still be very wise for you to take precautions until after we know more and we start to see the signal for what these vaccines are starting to do in terms of hopefully preventing infections, hopefully preventing serious infections, causing hospitalizations, and hopefully present preventing death. But what we have right now, in terms of the data from the manufacturers starting to come through in these trial results we've announced, um, is that we have data that they protect against infection. And we have to trust for the rest, frankly, and wait to see those results emerge um, over time. Jonathan Hill, that is. Does that answer some of your concerns? Yes, very much. Thank you. Um, Professor, if I could just pick up, because this is a concern that's relevant to a lot of people. Have the vaccines been tested on all sorts of different groups? So younger age groups, older age groups, people with underlying health conditions? Yes, thanks, Robbie. I do have some answers for you on that one. Um, so let me begin with um, the, the Pfizer vaccine. It was the first one to, to announce the results. Um, so in, in, that, uh, in, in those studies, which make up about 40-odd thousand um, patients, 41% of them were aged 56 to 85. 42% of them in the global studies were from black and minority ethnic groups, because we know that's important. And in the US study, it was 30%. The um, balance between the sexes was, was very, very good and essentially mirrored um, the populations from which they came. Now, for AstraZeneca, 
Um, I can tell you that I know that there are very significant thousands of elderly people in the AstraZeneca trials that have now read out. And a whole trial, a whole study was performed in South Africa. And then for Moderna, um, where, as you know, we have acquired now seven, seven million doses, um, uh, it was a study of more than 30,000 people, uh, over 7,000 were over 65. Um, because it was a US study, the categorization of, of um, eth ethnic minority status is slightly different, but the report they've given us, and it's in the public domain, is that um, 6,000 participants were um, uh, classified as Hispanic or Latin backgrounds, and 3,000 black or black African. So there's been an enormous effort by um, the, tr the uh, companies to get the right groups into the trials, because these are the people who we absolutely want to get the vaccine. And uh, we know it's going to be most important, particularly in relation to age. So there's been a big push to get um, older people into the trials. Thank you for that. Uh, Patients, if we can come to you next. Our poll showed that women are more likely to have doubts than men, as were black and minority ethnic groups. And you wanted to put some of those concerns to the professor. I just listened to you uh, list out the percentages of the uh, groups of people that the trials were carried on, quite a high percentage on ethnic minority people, 42. However, this information is not out there for ethnic minority people. And I suppose this is why there's that feeling, you know, of not wanting to be quote unquote guinea pigs to the vaccine. How safe is the vaccine? to use on ethnic minority people? And how are you looking to um, allay the fears within this community? Right, so I'm looking to you patients um, and the, you know, and, and these, these interviews and, and the, 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 the answers I've just given to Romilly to help get the message out that a very large number of um, uh, people from BAME backgrounds have been actively recruited and taken part in these trials. You're absolutely clear in your own mind, and you're absolutely right to be clear, that there is a very strong signal of increased mortality related to BAME backgrounds. Now, very little of that, in fact, is related to a pure genetic or racial um, uh, explanation. Uh, the experts have looked at it, and much more of it is related to chronic diseases and the age at which people from BAME backgrounds start to get chronic diseases, which is things like diabetes, which tends to be earlier than in um, uh, the, the white majority in this country. And so from that perspective, I am very hopeful that many, many BAME people are going to be picked out by the JCVI's prioritization um, emphasising that it will pick up people with at-risk underlying conditions right down to the age of 18. And it's essential because of the signal on mortality that um, BAME people feel confident to come forwards and have the vaccine. Now, I can tell you there's no biological reason whatsoever why um, the colour of your skin or your genetic makeup should in any way affect how you respond or don't respond to a vaccine. Um, it's, it's an inherent biological um, characteristic of all humans. And how safe are these vaccines? Well, I hope I've kind of um, given you a bit of an insight into the kind of sizes of these trials. Over 30,000 in one case, over 40,000 in another. Um, AstraZeneca so far have reported on uh, 26,000 people, but there's at least another 10,000 to go from their US study. So, um, you know, very, very large trials indeed. And the regulators look at all the data and decide if the vaccines pass their criteria on safety, on efficacy, and on manufacturing and product quality. And it's got, they've got to pass all three before they can be authorised for use. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really confident that um, our regulator, the MHRA, is, is going to do a, 
a superb job, their normal job, in fact. And uh, I, I don't see any signs that um, they're going to do anything differently from what they normally do. And I know this is kind of fear factor because this has all happened so fast. But what you need for a vaccine trial is you need volunteers and thanks to the volunteers who've come forwards and you give half of them the experimental vaccine and half of them a placebo, a dummy. And then you have to send them out into the big wide world and see what the rate of coronavirus disease is in those who got the vaccine and those who got the dummy. And if the vaccine is effective, the rate of coronavirus in those who got the dummy product will be much, much, much higher. And if it's a rare disease, you could take years and years and years to get the case numbers to be able to prove that point. But because coronavirus has just ravaged its way around the world and the manufacturers have placed trials in all over the world, Brazil, South Africa, UK, US, for example, um, because of that, they've got the case numbers they need to do the readout on effectiveness very, very quickly indeed. Um, so it's partly sad that we've got to the results so fast because it means we've had so much disease around in the world, but it is good from the point of view of vaccine development that these trials have moved very fast just because of case numbers. Thank you for that. John, I'm going to come to you next because I think you have a concern that many people share, which is about the speed of the trials. Uh, a, a number of my concerns have already been uh, addressed, but normally these trials take a much longer period of time and some people would think that this has been rushed through. Now, I'm sure that the MHRA will give this a very vigorous uh, examination before they uh, authorise it. Can you again reassure us that there be no shortcuts in in the process? Yeah, I can give you that reassurance. Where there have been, um, and uh, you know, I have some understanding of how the vaccine industry works. Where where you would normally go with a vaccine is that you're creating something which is a commercial entity at the end of the day. It's something that has to be sold um, for profit. And the companies behind the vaccines always want to do what we call a phase one study, a very small scale study to begin with. And then they want the results and then they want the results presented to a committee. And they, the committee may take three or four months before it decides whether it is prepared to put in the tens of millions of pounds that is needed to go to the next scale up, the phase two study. And then there's like another pause, and then there's another decision. Do we think there's a commercial product at the end of this? And then do we have another go decision? And you can see that this gets dragged out over months and months and months. In this case, everybody got it from the word go that um, these kind of money-based decisions must not get in the way of a global public health emergency. And governments, including our own, have been extremely generous to make sure that those um, normal kind of, uh, not barriers, but thresholds that the manufacturers have to consider uh, were not barriers. And because of that, things have been able to move very fast. Um, instead of designing a trial and then trying to go out and get the participants, many companies um, already said in advance, we are working on a coronavirus vaccine. Would you like to volunteer to be a participant in it? And we'll take your name now and we'll store it. And we might even go as far as kind of pre-recruiting you so that you're ready as soon as we are ready. And, um, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people in the UK have joined the NIHR COVID vaccine um, uh, volunteer register. And, uh, you know, in the trials that we've done in the UK, we've moved from, you know, no zero participants to many, many thousands in just a few weeks because everybody was ready to go. The whole system was ready to go. So that's where the corners have been cut on the, on the administrative timelines. The corners have not been cut on the actual size of the studies 
and the way in which the regulators will sit down and look at the data at the end. Now, the other thing that's happened is that instead of um, literally a lorry load of paperwork, which is the what we call the dossier for a vaccine that goes off to the regulator at the end, and basically the, the company say, this is what we've done, now please will you examine it and uh, give us your adjudication. Instead of handing that all in at the end, these manufacturers have handed it in to the regulators kind of week on week, month on month, as we've been going through 2020, so that there isn't this backlog of paperwork and studies to examine at the very end. And that's another way in which um, we've saved time without cutting corners. Can I just follow up on that? What you hear from quite a lot of people is that they would prefer to wait to see what the long-term side effects of some of these vaccines are. That's quite a legitimate concern, isn't it? All of the products that get through a regulator and get through the MHRA in our case will have been assessed for um, safety, for effectiveness and quality. Um, of course, there will be side effects. And of course, you know, you know, we know, for example, that sore arms um, are likely um, to be quite a feature of many of these vaccines. You know, that, there's, there's one for you. But you have to balance that against the fact that there are thousands of patients being admitted to hospital with coronavirus here and now. And probably we've got some very difficult months ahead of us. You know, you, you, could, you could wait forever um, to find the right time. The right time is when the risk is high and when your risk is high. And we know we've got, you know, whole generations of older people in the UK who are um, significantly at risk. They have not been exposed to the coronavirus yet. Um, and, you know, we've got to close that gap. Janine, can we come to you next? Uh, your concern is not so much about yourself, it's about your child. Um, thank you, Professor, for taking the time to answer the questions. Uh, my five-year-old son has been classified as vulnerable by NHS. Um, I'd like to know uh, what's the current stance on vaccinating vulnerable children, and do you have enough data about the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine on children? Right, okay. All of the signal so far has been that um, children are not generally at high risk from coronavirus. We are much less certain that um, their attack rates are lower, but in terms of serious consequences, we're fairly certain, um, everyone's continually looking at the global data, that they are not at high risk. And for that reason, um, these vaccines have been developed first in adults, and those are where the data will be. So I do not believe that any of these vaccines in the very first instance are likely to be formally authorised in children. I know the manufacturers are looking at that. And I know, for example, um, uh, there are a small number of uh, children down to 12 years of age in the Pfizer study, but I don't know the numbers. That's not been disclosed. I still don't think it's likely that these vaccines will be authorised um, in children. I think it's for JCVI to decide if there are going to be um, individual judgments about vaccinating children on a case-by-case -case basis according to um, probably quite severe need and severe vulnerability but that's a matter for JCVI to look at not for me to pronounce on on ITV. Um, we are where we are the trials have not been done at any scale in children I know manufacturers are interested in considering vaccines for children in due course, but if you look at the signal of deaths um, in the first wave and in the second wave, it's overwhelmingly related to age, and after that, related to having an at-risk condition and being an adult. So from that perspective, again, the, the manufacturers had to start where the need was greatest. Janani, would you like to ask a follow-up question on that? Um, uh, uh, so if, if at any point a child is being vaccinated or any vulnerable person is being vaccinated, could they be carriers because their, their family members will be much down in the line of yeah. priority? Would they be carriers? Thank you for that. Good question. Um, we don't know yet whether these vaccines will prevent transmission. 
In other words, they'll prevent people being carriers or um, able to shed it without having the disease themselves and pass it to others. We don't know yet that. Um, all we know, because that's the only thing that's been looked at in the trials so far, is about the prevention of confirmed coronavirus illness. I'm quite hopeful, actually, um, that we will see some signals over reductions in transmission. But it's just one of these things, again, a bit like Jonathan's question, that we just can't know right now. There's no way we can know it. We have to find it out by using the vaccines. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we get a great signal that when we're uh, many people, millions of people in the UK have taken up these vaccines, um, we'll, we'll get a signal that, yes, they're not only stopping disease, they're stopping transmission. And um, then, you know, then it, then it starts to be a real game changer. Professor, our poll showed that currently 67% of people are saying that they are likely to take the vaccine. Is mm. there a danger that not enough people will take it in order for it to be effective? Right. Um, whoever takes it is going to be protected very meaningfully against coronavirus. So um, every single person that takes it gets benefit. What I think you're hinting at, Romilly, is whether we need a given percentage um, uh, to achieve what is known as herd immunity and so forth. It's far too soon to talk about that. It's related to uh, Janani's question about whether the vaccines also reduce transmission. And um, we have to wait and see for that one uh, for the time being. Right now, the right thing to do is to focus on those really high risk groups. What about the idea of vaccine passports? Would that be a good way of encouraging people to, to take it? We are absolutely certain that we have to have really good records to know who's had the vaccine and who hasn't. But um, I haven't considered the idea of a vaccine passport. But, um, you know, you, you have to remember that there are some countries that uh, will insist on a yellow fever vaccination. Um, if you're um, a, a Muslim pilgrim and you're going to the Hajj, you'll be required to have certain vaccinations as a, as a, a prerequisite of it of uh, going to the Hajj um, ceremonies, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, th those concepts are not new, but I, I think that it's far too early to talk about those in relation to coronavirus vaccines. The real job of work now is to get our vulnerable people protected. Can I just ask uh, all of our participants who would like to ask a, a, f a further question? John. Uh, th th uh, thank you, Romilly, uh, Professor. I think you've explained now that the vaccine will certainly help prevent infection, but it seems to me we're not sure whether it will prevent serious, more serious infection in those people that actually get it leading to hospitalisation. And my second question, if I may, is realistically, are most of the elderly and the vulnerable likely to be, have, be vaccinated by Easter, as been suggested? Thank you for those two questions. So on the first one about hospitalisation, in other words, the prevention of dis severe disease, it's a really good question. And um, I am very hopeful that we are going to see that signal. The AstraZeneca um, press release, or it may have been the Oxford University press release, but that consortium have already said that they have seen from the AstraZeneca vaccine no hospitalizations for COVID-19 whatsoever in patients who received the vaccine, whereas they have seen hospitalizations in the people who got the dummy or the placebo. So from that perspective, there are some data already, but they are small numbers. And I think I want to see the full data before I comment further on that. But is it a reasonable expectation? And uh, are there already some data from AstraZeneca on this point? Yes, there are. And then to your second point about how quick can we go to get um, the vulnerable in this country um, uh, vaccinated. Um, it depends on vaccine supply and we're working very hard on that now. 
um, across multiple manufacturers. It also depends upon um, how quickly the NHS can mobilise and get people vaccinated. And it depends on how willing and cooperative people are in coming forwards when they're called and booking their appointments and so forth. Um, I personally think that the kind of time frame you're talking about is realistic, but I don't want to put a figure on it until we get into the programme and see um, just how difficult it is to do, because it will be difficult and there will be bumps in the road and people should expect that. Um, but uh, is the NHS going to give this a massive, massive effort? Um, yes, it is for sure. I assure you of that. And um, to anyone who's listening and who is going to have one of these vaccines, please remember that um, almost all of the ones that are coming through, you require two doses, one, one month apart, roughly speaking. And um, it will be important for everybody who is part of that programme to come back for your second dose and finish the course. And you'll get full protection probably 10 to 14 days after the second dose. Professor, I think we have to wrap up fairly soon, but I, I have a couple more questions. Uh, all of our participants' questions have been eminently reasonable, but there are uh, some more outlandish uh, theories going about online and people are being swayed by them. So I think it's right that we address them uh, quickly. Um, firstly, is the vaccine program trying to implant uh, microchips into people? I'm really not sure that's um, a, even a sensible question. If you think about the AstraZeneca vaccine at uh, th three, three, three pounds a dose, is what, is what we expect it's going to cost um, globally, internationally. Why would you do that? Another one, uh, uh, another bit of um, vaccine misinformation uh, that people are suggesting is that the severity of the side effects are being covered up. The um, MHRA will look at all of that. Um, the data I've seen so far suggests that the um, side effects are pretty mild compared to the side effects of COVID-19 in a vulnerable person. All you've got to do is look at some TV footage of vulnerable people stuck on ICU, stuck inside oxygen bubbles and um, being critically ill for many periods of time, having to say goodbye to their loved ones before they go into hospital. Come on, you know, that, you know that's the real side effect of COVID-19. And you, you've got to and put all of that in the context of the threat of the disease. Thank you. Um, you are a man who is famous for uh, his love of metaphors. How would you state where we are vis-a-vis -a, -vis a vaccine now? We are at the very beginning of um, what I think, what I hope will be a journey that takes us into a different place um, by late spring. Okay, thank you very much. And if I can just ask all of our guests, uh, if you could perhaps with a show of hands, uh, indicate whether your concerns have been allayed by what you have heard from the professor today. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I think that's a <laughs> thumbs up from everybody. Could I also say that uh, the, the professor's answers have been exceedingly comprehensive and there's a, he's conveyed to us an awful lot of information that uh, other people are probably not quite aware of. And his reassurance about the process for registration is, is, is heartening. Thank you for that, John. I'm glad you <laughs> found it useful and reassuring. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Van Tam, for your participation today. Not at all. Nice to meet you all.